it is very easy for us to have hearts that are not capable of hearing your word and to have pride so lifted up that we think everything needs to be about us and we we plead with you lord in the name of jesus that you would open your word to us open our hearts that we might be like like little children so that your word might bless us in truth so that we might worship you with with zeal and sincerity we pray in christ's name amen well it's been a couple weeks since we've been in luke and we are at chapter 4 verse 14. <clears throat> this is the first recorded sermon that jesus or message that jesus gave children you probably wish that um your preacher preached such short sermons <laughs> he read a passage of scripture shorter than what joel read and and then he sat down and he didn't say a word and so everybody looking at him i don't know how you can sit down and have everybody looking at you maybe the reader was in a special seat in the synagogue everybody's looking at him and he says this day these words are fulfilled before you and they the result was they wanted to take him to a cliff and throw him off now i, I want you to be children i want you to be thinking the there's a little byline there giving attendance to doctrine, excuse me, to reading, to doctrine, to exhortation. Meditate on these things. Give yourself wholly to them. That's the exercise of the Christian life. The reading of the Word of God. Thank you, Joel, for reading it. You do an excellent job, and I appreciate that. As we hear the Word read, um, I still remember the first time I heard this passage read when I was a child. And I remember the thoughts that it made me think. And it's just so important to have hearts that are anxious and ready and, and careful to hear the Word of God. This is give attendance to doctrine. Now doctrine is a pretty fancy word nowadays, but it literally just means teaching. You read the Word of God, and what is it? teaching. We're going to find that word doctrine in this passage today. There's something said about Jesus' doctrine. But it's, it's the teaching. And so we'll be asking you what some of the doctrine that Jesus was teaching today. And the exhortation. Well, when you teach something, you teach about what is true. You give that right framework from the Word of God. And the exhortation comes along and what are you going to do about it? How are you going to respond to the Word of God in your own heart and in your own life. And that's where meditating, meditating on these things, giving yourself wholly to them, that's what you, t you carry forth. Carry forth in the day by day, in the hour by hour, thinking about things and giving yourself wholly to them, meaning conforming your life to the Word of God as the Holy Spirit prompts you. So I trust the Holy Spirit will bless us this morning with his word and our hearts being capable. So the little segment that was read, I, I should have added one more verse to it, but I'll add at the end. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Jesus is returning from the wilderness, if you remember there. He was tempted in the wilderness of Satan for 40 days. Then, say, then um, he rebuked Satan, and the Holy Spirit ministered to him. He came out filled with the Holy Spirit and returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now Galilee's a region, and there went about fame through, about him through all that region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now, it's important when we read the Word that we listen to it, intently with the accuracy of what it is that's the first verse about his preaching and so it seems to me if you take just the natural reading of the text 
that Jesus had already gone about the region of Galilee and he had already been going to synagogues and we don't know any more about it than that except that as he went about to all these synagogues it says that the fame of him spread through all the region so you need to think about that in the context Jesus was getting a lot of notoriety a lot of fame as the word was spreading out from him and you can remember there was that baptism of John and everybody was already going out to John in the wilderness being baptized the baptism of John and Jesus was baptized of John and the voice spoke from heaven this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased and then Jesus disappeared for 40 days and he was fasting and tempted of the devil but he went into the wilderness in the power of the Spirit and today the verse tells us he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit so he was he was walking in the power of the Spirit and he went around to the different synagogues um, if I could explain this to you children in a real brief sense of the word the synagogue was the local house of worship where the Jews from that area would gather together read the word have the word taught to them explained and the temple was in Jerusalem where you would go you at least once a year if not uh, more than a couple times depending on how far away it was and what you were disposed to do but the temple was where the Shekinah glory dwelt and all of the significant ritual practices of worship but the synagogue was sim similar to our local congregations that we have today in different communities around the world. And so Jesus was visiting the different synagogues. So that's backdrop, that's context. And so after visiting other synagogues in Galilee, it says he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now here's a little bit of interpreting problem. As his custom was, what's he referring to? Um, I believe the custom of synagogues was such that there was a rotation of the elder men in the, in the synagogue and they would take turns reading from the scripture text and perhaps giving meaning to the reading. It's possible also that in that process of sharing, when there was somebody visiting a synagogue, they would also be given that opportunity to read the scripture of the day. And so um, we can interpret this one of two ways. I'm not going to make uh, a big um, issue of it but the custom simply could have meant that as Jesus came out of the wilderness and the power of the Spirit and he went visiting synagogue after synagogue in Galilee his custom was stand up to read and they would give him the book and it's possible that the little scene that we're seeing right here had occurred already multiple times in other synagogues in Galilee before he comes to Nazareth. We do know that fame had gone before. Now, <clears throat> children, I want us to pay close attention. How many siblings did Jesus have? Anybody know how many were, were named in the scripture? How many siblings did Jesus have? I, I think it was five. It might have been more, um, but they're named in one of the passages that are similar to this where the people are indignant and they just wait a minute this is just Jesus his parents are Joseph and Mary and his sister the sisters and his brothers are such and such and so and so who does he think he is now the Bible commands us to be humble to walk in humility One of the greatest barricades or barriers to walking in humility is our 
false sense of humility. So we think that, uh, okay, I'll put it to you in, in more modern terms. Have you ever heard of the word self-esteem? Well, our culture is kind of enamored with the discussion about self-esteem. <clears throat> And we're concerned that people don't have low self-esteem. And so what happens is low self-esteem is a form of pride that makes it very difficult to receive ministry from anyone. really enter into an arena and we think about others and what we probably one of the most powerful aspects of what we call peer pressure group pressure is everybody's being expected to stay in the boundaries of what's acceptable because we don't want any stellar standouts in the group that make the rest of us look even more stupid than we already feel we are so it's important that we think about the scripture as we're reading it here in the context of our own experience. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to meditate and to hear exhortation on it. But it's important to see that as Jesus came in, he came to do a customary thing. It was within the boundaries of cultural acceptation that Jesus could come into the synagogue and apparently he could come into any synagogue in the context of that day. Sit in the reader's bench, however you get there. Read the scripture and then give your little message. So it's important going backwards to realize this is what the scripture says he had been doing before he comes to Nazareth. As he had been doing this, the fame of him went out. Apparently there was power in his preaching. And you can, you can see in just a few minutes as we go over how he read the text. He, he just read the text simply, measured his words very carefully. And the impact of those measured words with the reading of scripture was pretty significant. And apparently fame was spreading abroad about Jesus at this early time frame. And so here he is, staying within the boundaries as it was customary. He would come to the synagogue and he sat in the reader's bench and he stood up to read and they handed him the book and he opened it to Isaiah. Now, this I, th I think it's Isaiah 62, but um, the interesting part, he reads the following. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Pause. Children, are, are, are we listening? We just read in the account, the scripture taught us, the doctrine of scripture. When Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God was upon him, but it came in a visible form, like a dove. And then he was, he was carried by that power of the Spirit. He was took, taken into the wilderness and tempted for 40 days. His faith, his works, his love, his everything about that, who Jesus was as God-man was solidified in that wilderness temptation. And he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. ministry he went to these different synagogues and basically made this announcement from the scripture the spirit of the Lord is upon me and there had already been enough said and people are waiting and looking for the Messiah and they're looking to Jesus and then he gives 
his assignment that was there for him to read. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, Really special homeschool assignment. There it is, children. Get a, get a notebook and divide it up. And, and each section, have each section be an expression of one of these ministries by the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was anointed to bring forth. Preaching the gospel to the poor, healing the broken heart, or delivers to the captive. And, and go through the gospels and take each account of Jesus' interaction with people and bring that account over and put it under one of those columns. That'd be a very, a very valuable homeschool assignment, very, a very good way of meditating on the way Jesus went about teaching and preaching the Word of God. Now, every one of those things mentioned are And we have such a difficulty with our pride, so much difficulty with our pride, that we have a hard time hearing. <clears throat> Do you remember when Jesus said, I didn't come to the well, I came to heal the sick. I didn't come to the righteous, I came to save sinners. So, in our insecurity, where we see our flaws, and we wish we were different, we wish we were better, or whatever, in that insecurity, I've often deceived myself to think that that's humility. I'm thinking lowly of myself. But I'm really not thinking lowly of myself. I'm thinking more highly of myself than I ought because I'm thinking I shouldn't be this dumb or whatever. I should be better so I can be better esteemed or whatever. So there's a natural tension that exists. And I want us to understand that um, one of the greatest scoffings that, that are thrown against the gospel is arrogant men and women who say, that church stuff, that, that religion stuff, that's for weak people, people on crutches. But I'm strong, I don't, I don't need help. I don't need God. And that's that, there's that natural tension. And it's very true that it's our need and it's our helplessness that brings us to God. So when Jesus announces his preaching ministry and he declares the kind of ministry, just look at who 
is going to be the recipient. The poor. I'm not poor. I have more than Joe. And maybe I put up all my veneer so it looks like I have more. And I hide all my poverty behind my veneer. The brokenhearted. You know what the opposite of brokenhearted is? Pardon? Okay, hard-hearted is, is the result of it. But I think bitter, bitterness is. When I'm brokenhearted, I've been devastated by a loss that has been inflicted on me. And I have great need out of that brokenheartedness. But when I turn that into resentment and anger and bitterness against the one that inflicted that injustice to me upon me, I'm at great risk of being bitter, but then being hard hearted because I think everything that the opposite is hard hearted in terms of being able to receive the word. Recovering of sight to the blind. Now, this is spiritual blindness because the Pharisees once said to Jesus, Are we blind? And he said, well, because you say you see, you can't have your sight restored. And so you're permanently blind. So it's a spiritual blindness and a physical blindness. We know Jesus healed blind men in the text of scripture. Deliverance to the captives. Setting at liberty those that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I, I, wanna, I wanna suggest that it is God's intention to prepare our hearts for the message and the deliverance of Christ by subjecting us to a great amount of need so that we, we can clearly see that we have no strength, that without or apart from God, we can do nothing. So these are tremendous things, and they're things that society frowns on, makes fun of, eschews. And so we naturally tend to buffer ourselves as if we're better, and when we buffer ourselves as if we're better, we, we close our ears to what's being said. And so he closed the book. Very short reading. Now, I, I, would, I, I wish I knew what kind of book he had. If I remember, I mean, the tradition of the Jews was to have scrolls. And I guess a scroll can be called a book. But um, he did have to find the place. Of course, any book, you have to find your place that you're reading. But he closed the book, gave it to the minister, and sat down. And all eyes in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now notice what it says in the text. He began to say to them, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. It's a declaration that the anointed one has come to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. It's now. They heard the message. And listen to what the people thought. How come we have to listen to these gracious words from this dude? Who does he think he is, anyway? Isn't this Joseph's son? 
and other, other passages enumerate the siblings. That's pretty significant. So this morning, I want to exhort you that the ability to hear the Word of God has more to do with your condition of your heart in terms of your pride than it has to do with the message and the hope of the message. <clears throat> I mean, think of it in comparison. Jesus had been going through all the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues. The scripture says he was preaching in the power of the Spirit. And the text said that the fame of Jesus spread abroad. The fame of Jesus spread abroad. So there was a lot. I mean, you know, people were talking about this Jesus. So back at home in Nazareth, people knew who Jesus was. And here he comes and he sits in the reader's chair and he gets up to read and he reads probably what he read at every other synagogue and he reads it in the power of the Spirit, declaring the anointing of the Spirit of God upon himself to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And they were offended because of who Jesus was. The most difficult place to be humble in the world is in your own home. The most difficult place in the world to be humble is your own home. You see your mom and dad and you see them in their full-blown weakness and strength all mixed together. You see your siblings and it's the same. And it's so easy to forget God and just look at, at man. And just the nature of their question, is not this Joseph's son, as if to say, he doesn't have a right to be notable. You know, essentially, he doesn't have a right to be the son of God, I'm sorry. He's in our town, in our church. And he's no different, he's no better than anybody else. <clears throat> now, so, as we go forward, I just want to address your, yours and my insecurity. Our insecurities are so subtle that we're often blind to them entirely. And we think we're walking in sincerity and we think we're walking in, in faith and we think that we're reflecting the grace of God like we ought. But we have this discomfort of not being significant in the eyes of other people. <clears throat> Twice this week in little readings of scripture that I've been able to have, I've come across the reminder from scripture that you and I are to be those who are waiting for the exaltation that God is going to bring to us. If we're going to be exalted, if we're going to be honored, if God's going to say to us, well done. We have to wait on that for the Lord's good time. I think I was in second grade. Maybe I was in first, but I think it was second grade. I was in a school. Every morning they would have announcements. And I forget the details. I don't forget the emotion at all. <clears throat> but. The principal came over the loudspeaker this morning and said, <clears throat> this morning we want to honor so and so and such and such for this and that and the other. And I have no clue, I don't remember what, what the honor was all about. But all I remember was, you know, this is a school, we have about 60 kids in eight grade levels. So, you know, do the math, there's quite a few kids in this building and one child 
gets singled out over the whole student body. What do you think I thought in my heart? What do you say? I want to be that kid. How did they get that? What makes them so special? <laughs> and I, w I was immediately wanting my name to be read over the microphone for whatever. And I don't fully remember, but I, I, I know that the pattern's there, and it's very possible that I did this also at the same time. I did something like, well, what makes them so special? They're no different than me. <laughs> and I, I think I went through some little thing like that. Brothers and sisters, wow. When we depend on our identity from other people patting us on the back and giving us accolades, when it's important to us what people say about us, we're in serious spiritual trouble because we're in a place there's two things that Satan's going to use against us. One, he's going to build a resistance in our heart from hearing the word. Because when I hear the word, I'm going to hear that I am needy. I am going to hear that I need to repent. I'm going to hear that I am broken. And if I'm already struggling with my identity and the culture I'm in, I'm going to have a hard time hearing new bad information. I already think badly enough about myself. And so it's so imperative to transfer any desire for my own glory, to transfer that to the Lord. The Lord himself is glorified. And I glorify the Lord in my words and in my heart and my action. And I do it very deliberately so that by the grace of God, I might have that connection to the Lord by his word. So Jesus tells them the interpretation of their question. Surely you will say to me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy own country. You know what Jesus just tells them? This is the beginning of his ministry. It's going to last about three years. And Jesus is telling his hometown synagogue, you guys are never going to get over me. Your pride, who you think you are, and your jealousy that you're not like me or that the Spirit of God has anointed me, that's going to prevent you from ever responding to my message. Look back historically when you hear stories of gospel news Jesus promised it and it's true again and again and again. A family member gets saved and so often the rest of the family turns against them and hates their guts because they can't handle somebody becoming transformed by the grace of God as if to say there was something wrong with the family to begin with. So he continued speaking. Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. No prophet is accepted in his own country. And he gives two illustrations. The widow that, Eli that Elias brought uh, made food for. I tell you the truth, many widows were in the land of Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Saripata, a city of Sidon, unto a widow, excuse me, a woman that was a widow. Um, one account. Many lepers in Israel at the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saying, Naaman the Syrian. Now, the illustration here is these were non Jews. 
These were not part of the family. <clears throat> and the warning is, and here's the exhortation to you and me, children, I, 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 th I think this causes me to tremble more than any other thing as a dad and as a pastor. The familiarity that we have with the people of God has so much potential to harden our hearts against the sensitivity that we need to seek the Lord and to ask for his help. And it's, and it's a, a, a remarkable thing that people who are extremely familiar, extremely religious, they have this reduced footprint of the living and moving spirit of God in their midst. It's just our pride. It's just our pride. Our pride is the barrier to the free moving work of the Holy Spirit. And so the crowd confirmed his message with their angry response. All they in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath, rose up and thrust him out of the city, led him to the brow of a hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. So he proved his point. They couldn't receive the slightest word of exhortation. And their anger and their sense of self-righteousness was such, they were ready to throw Jesus off down the hill headlong. And then the text says this, but he passing through the midst of them went his way. Maybe I should have taken that verse and left it, that part of the verse and left it with the last one. When I was a child and I heard this passage read, what a powerful ministry the Lord brought to my heart as I, I realized I was just a child. I realized Jesus could never be killed until the time. And there was this little secret comfort and a little secret confidence that the Lord put in my heart that my life is secure in the Lord's hands when I'm walking after God by the Spirit of God for the purpose of God. And I mean, it's, I'm sorry, an angry mob from the synagogue dragging you all the way to the cliff, that's pretty, pretty significant and likely that you're going to be thrown off the cliff, but not so. Jesus just turned and walked through the crowd, and he was untouched. <clears throat> the last exhortation, the last lesson from our pride, we only hurt ourselves. You can't change the truth. You can't diminish the offer for help. And you can't change the course of history that God has based on salvation and redemption. Those who resist, those who are stubborn, those who resent that truth, simply have rejected it for themselves. But the gospel goes on. The truth goes forward. Today, is September 27th. Tonight at 9.27 or something like that, we have the beginning of a major Jewish festival holiday. And we're having the so-called blood moons, of which I think you all know about that, right? <clears throat> Time is going on, and the Lord has a plan, and that plan in, in includes his return in establishing a kingdom on the earth, a kingdom that we'll be a part of. Are you prepared? And you say, well, what do you mean? Uh, yeah, we got 
we got five 50 gallon drums of water in the basement safe. Got 700 pounds of wheat tucked away tidily. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that kind of preparation. Are you prepared? If you and I aren't prepared with humility, then we will be incapable of letting our need, the, the felt strength of our need, hit us fully so that we smart with the pain of our own need. And then we turn with that smarting pain to the Lord. And we call on his name and we ask for his help. And we seek his face. And we, we have confidence in knowing that he is the one who's made the promise. He's the one to whom our allegiance is given and we trust and we rest. <clears throat> At my age, I am so astonished at how much pride still has the major sway in my natural daily flow of life. And just the fact that I said I'm so surprised shows you how proud I am. <laughs> the Word of God enters by the power of the Spirit of God gives us perspective you can have nowhere else. And it's brought to those that have no other hope, no other resource, who are looking, who are not looking elsewhere for any help, but God alone. May the familiarity that we share as family, may it, may it not be used by us to harden our hearts against the word of God in this day of need. Let's pray. Thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you how the Holy Spirit entering in as promised by Jesus takes your word and quickens it and makes it alive in us. Hallelujah, what a heritage we have that you can make us alive by your word. Lord, I pray for our need for humility. Individually, Lord, that we might rest in, I think of that little boy's question to his daddy. Daddy, are you a sinner? I hope so. Because Jesus only saves sinners. Lord, let us see the, the desperate nature of our need, the hopelessness of help coming from anywhere else but you. And may we walk in the humility of that reality, seeking your face. May, may your word minister to us. May it, may it teach us what's right. May it rebuke us and exhort us in the way that we should go. Grant to us, Lord, that we might be thinking about your word all of the time. And I thank you, Lord, that when I was a child, I heard this word standing in a church service. And you've allowed me to think and meditate on that word so many times, how Jesus just passed through the angry mob because his time was not yet and no one could touch him. Give us that same blessing, Lord, that your word accompanies us so that we can give ourselves wholly to it in whatever circumstance or difficulty we're in. We ask in Christ's name, amen.